So this is the world premiere. So uh, is it nice to finally, you know what I mean? Have you tested the movie? Like, what is it? You know what I mean? The yeah, we did test the movie. That was close to this, but not a fully finished film. Um, but it's awesome seeing. I actually had a good screen. I didn't know if I was going to stay. Um, but I had a good experience, which is rare. Because it's you sort of are like in a fugue state when you make the movie or, you know, and then it's hard to, it's, it's really hard to keep watching it over and over. And I watched this movie more than I think I've watched any movie I've made. Um, just because the editor, Martin Bernfeld, who's here and I, you know, really try to watch it and, you know, watch it and not get bogged down in any single scene and then watch it again and keep having kind of a bird's eye view, no pun intended, of the film so i've watched this movie so many times and what's really difficult is you you just start to remember every iteration and you start to wonder if the iteration before in any way the take the sound the picture was better and so you end up just at least for me you end up watching the movie and all you can see is the previous version <laughs> and not the version you're watching um but I, I think I watched this version, and I was, I was in it. So it was great to answer your question. I enjoyed it. Uh, before we get started, I just want to give a shout out, because I think someone from your movie drove down from Oregon to be here. I don't know where they're sitting, though. Oh, up there. There we go. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> who is that? Someone who is part of the movie's crew? I can't see you up there. Oh, Welcome to the screening. Thank you for coming. I just want to, I want to give I want to give a shout out to anyone who comes down from oh, Oregon. Oh, 100%. Yeah, exactly. And by the way, our extras were not just a set cuz an extra sitting here, but our extras were fantastic in the movie and like it that can be a tough part of making a film especially when you're in a setting with so many people in a school. They can really it it can they can be hard days. So Did you like the movie? Yeah. I did. I liked it a lot. <laughs> Good. Um, so uh, a lot of people in this theater know how the sausage is made and they know the behind the scenes of, of making movies. So what for each of you, what do you think would surprise people to learn about the making of Little Wing? How long it took. <laughs> <laughs> Although maybe nobody would find that surprising. I have to say that I am, as the person who wrote the story that kind of gave birth to the whole project it it's quite amazing to see it here come to life um this i'll tell you what's really amazing is the young girl who i first profiled when i did the story recently got her phd from stanford in zoology and is now teaching at the medical school at Yale. Wow. Pretty amazing. I mean, she was a very special girl. She was really, uh, you know, I met her in a completely chance encounter. I was walking my dog, she was walking her dog, and we started chatting and she mentioned in passing that she raised homing pigeons, which was a sport I associated with 75 year old men in <laughs> undershirts um, and I, I thought this is really interesting that this young girl is involved in this sport that she's got to be the only young girl doing this um, and I could tell she was special so bright so interesting and completely an iconoclast you know it doesn't make you cool when you're in 8th grade to be raising pigeons, as you can imagine, but she just went her own way, and I think the movie really captures that, which I really like, because she was a special kid, and she's turned into a really impressive young woman. I think my one um, anecdote about what might surprise people to know about the making of the film is that Brooklyn, our wonderful lead actress, arrived on set 
and we arranged for her to have her first meeting with the bird trainers so she could meet the pigeons and start to work with the pigeons and learn how to hold the pigeons. And what was revealed in that moment was that she was afraid of birds. <laughs> And it was really hard for her. Like, she was really afraid of birds. Um, and obviously, you can see in the film, she worked through her fear. She spent a lot of time with the birds and developed a real relationship with them. I think it's really indicative of who she is also. Because you kind of, I remember for me, I was like, who auditions for a movie co when you're totally afraid of your co-star? And Brooklyn Prince does, because she's this fearless amazing, adventurous, young woman, girl, woman, uh, who I think loves to face her fears and dive right in. So that was kind of a, a fun behind the scenes anecdote. <laughs> so my 42nd retell of this is that Steven Spielberg read this, I love the way Brian Cox said Susan Orleans. I know. <laughs> he elevated me. So I am now French. Susan, who is a very accomplished, famous, brilliant writer, who famously wrote the book The Orchid Thief, which Charlie Kaufman wrote a brilliant movie about how hard it was to adapt Susan Orleans' book into a movie, and I think he won the Oscar for it. And so Steven Spielberg reads her beautiful piece in The New Yorker and wants to make a movie, then I have to go meet with Steven Spielberg in his office. We talk about all these things, and he's like, I want you to do this. I'm like, yeah, yeah, we didn't really talk about anything. And then suddenly it was like my agent calling and saying, so they want to make a deal for you to write this movie. I'm like, what movie? I was like, it's this beautiful little like piece that's like, what? But it's a girl, she met a girl, and she's got racing pigeons. And so I just had to kind of take what was there and try to find, like Jan Vari was my high school health teacher who was a Vietnam vet, who I worked for over the summer as a lifeguard, because whatever. So it, it just was like crazy how you just, I was in such fear and panic of having to try to deliver a script and made up this whole, this heist and the value of a bird. And like, it just kind of was like a long story that just kind of became more and more bananas. And it's just, I got to meet Susan Orlean back then, and you know, I got to visit and chat with her and everything. I was like, oh, this is amazing, Steven Spielberg and Susan Orlean. I was like, what, the, what am I gonna do? And so it was just the fact that that was 2000, and what year was the article? I wanted to say 2006 or five, but somebody um, before said 2007. I, I can't, yeah, I, honestly, I can't time. remember. Well, let's see, my son is 19 and he was Yeah, so that was two. He was just born. Or one, so It was an overnight success story. Yeah. Who's good at, I think yeah. it's 2007. Okay. By the way, I am seeing myself creating a little specialty here, which is, Writing things that people are really scared to adapt. <laughs> it's working for you. I would, I would stick with it. Um, I, I don't know if this is surprising or not. I, the movie's music, the sort of sonic signature of the film, originally was hip hop. And it was Tupac Shakur. Right. And when we ended up going to Portland to shoot it. We, and this was, I think it was Naomi's suggestion. It was, it was Nay. Um, saying, well, we should embrace what's, you know, authentic to Portland, and that is the whole punk rock scene. And if, you know, Caitlin being this fearless young character played by Brooklyn, who also embodies all of that, we should look at Bikini Kill and Riot Girl and everything that comes with that. And it was really an inspired idea because it's so a part of the DNA of the movie. Um, and, you know, that was never really intended and sort of came at, at the last minute. Also, it probably, I mean, not to work in budget, but it probably saved you a lot of money, too. <laughs> we weren't thinking about that. We were thinking about the art. <laughs> sure. Okay? But I can't imagine the budget of, of, of using all of his songs in a soundtrack. Well, it was never going to be all of his songs. But, and also it would have. But yes, um, the budget probably came down. But the way. The but it's better for it. <laughs> but it is. No, it, by the way, it's, it's a smart choice that also saved you a lot of money. 
True. Yes. But to know, I mean, so the way the movie gets made is Brian Robbins, who runs all of Paramount, was somebody that I worked for when he was a director. And I said, oh, I have this script that's Paramount owns, you know, and he was like, oh, we love that little script. And I was like, Dean, what about Dean? So I love Dean. And then he was like, if you guys get Brian Cox to be in the movie, we'll make this movie. So we had to go try to get Brian Cox. Now, going back to Susan Orlean, she had... He was in your other. He was in uh, um, adaptation. Adaptation. He played the screenwriting teacher. So I think there was something that kind of made it a little, gave it a little bit of something. He was like, Definitely. "Oh, it's based on Susan's piece. It must be good." <laughs> so it made him at least look at it, right? I mean, you never know how the weird connective things. I mean, that go this into is also. I mean, this together. is maybe a cool story that is maybe surprising based on how long it took the movie to get made. Um, which is that, you know, it took, you know, John has been with the script for so long, John and Susan, and, it, you know, there are many fits and starts along the way that I wasn't a part of. And when I did become a part of it, that was, you know, it was five or six years ago. So we were trying to push it up the hill for all of that time. Um, and it had its own sort of fits and starts and lives and deaths. And, um, and then Brian read it and liked it. And then we started to sort of make a deal with Brian and it was kind of like, well, maybe, maybe, the, maybe this movie, well, I'd sort of been like, this movie's never happening, but it's fun every once in a while to get a call from the studio and be like, maybe we're making this movie. And after all of this time, I got a phone call and it was uh, Shauna Phelan who runs Awesomeness, who we are all very indebted to, um, who supports this movie like no other executive and Brian Banks is also who, here who's a huge supporter of the film um, and said, well, Brian has a window. Can you leave in five days and shoot the movie in seven weeks time? And I just said, yes. I, I mean, I honestly had no idea what the aunt, I mean, I knew the answer had to be yes, but I had no idea if we could prep the movie in seven weeks. I had no idea. And I said, yes. And then John called me and said, Brian Robbins had called him and had the same discussion with him. And he said, Dean, I just got off the phone with Brian and he kept saying to me, like, do you think you can make this window and can you prep this movie in seven weeks? And I just said, yes, but Dean, I have no idea. Like, can we do it in seven weeks? And I just said yes to John too, but I didn't know. And so it's like got greenlit in like after 17 years, it got greenlit in three days. Uh, I have, it's, that's effing crazy. <laughs> But it doesn't, I will give you so much credit because this movie does not look like you were rushing to film it. It looks like you had this shit thought out and, you know, it, it looks fantastic for such a short, you know, window. Yeah, I mean, thank you. We ultimately got eight weeks of prep. I did think we were going to, I did, I did have this thing in my mind where I was like, it's, we're definitely going to push a week. So we did get eight weeks of prep, but still, but we did shoot it in seven weeks and I would give another to Jeff Wallace, the production designer is here. And yeah, I mean, it's, you know, he and his team, the design of the movie is so, I think, specific and thought through. And I, I never felt rushed when we were making the movie because I think we were, when we were working off a great script. So when you're in prep and you're working off a good script, every day you aren't scrambling in prep to figure out how to fix something. All you're doing is figure out, figuring out how to dramatize the scenes in the best way possible. And so we were really free in prep to be just dealing with the material and not dealing with problems in the material. And, and once we started shooting, I, I honestly, I, I, once we started shooting, we were, I felt ready to shoot and I never felt rushed making the movie. Another funny thing that happened was we got Brian Cox. I'm like, great, it's all good. And then Brian Robbins is like, can you get Kelly Riley? And I was like, we had done flight together 10 years before. So I was like, why me? Like, why do I have to? So like I emailed her, she was in London. I was like, hey, remember me? Um, so I was like, so would you read this script? And she was like, okay. So she read the script and sent me a lovely email back. I said, talk to Dean. So then Dean and, and Kelly had a Zoom and next thing you know, like Kelly was signing on to the movie. Now the movie's coming together wicked fast. And I said, um, Naomi. So like, I remember talking to Sean and I was like, look, Naomi has to make this movie with us. She has to go there. She has to do it. It was like, there was all kinds of stuff going on. There was COVID, there was a strike, there was all this stuff. And I literally was like, can you guys meet and see if this works and just like leave two days later and go make the movie? That's what I remember. Is that pretty much right? 
Yeah. <laughs> I, got, I got a call. You said, go meet Dean. See if you guys, I think you guys will hit it off. I went to Dean's house and we probably spent like an hour together. And I was like, I love the script. I was like, I think I really like Dean. And then the next time I saw Dean was maybe like three days later at the airport yeah. getting on a plane to Portland. And we were like, it was the shotgun marriage. I think it worked out pretty well, though. It did. It was <laughs> kismet. One of the things that I really enjoy about this script is that it treats the kids with respect. It deals with serious subject matter, but not in like a heavy handed way. It, it's just well written. Can you sort of talk about that aspect of the script that, especially with kids, because sometimes like movies with kids are just real bad. And this is, you know, I'm not trying to, you know, but this is well, well written and uh, with a lot of respect. So, Teenagers, um, I love writing teenage characters because they're just interesting. They make a lot of crazy decisions. I always say that, you know, teenagers have been sneaking out their window since the dawn of time. It's like to do lots of, make lots of bad decisions. And I just think we kind of love them for that and we kind of forgive them and they're unpredictable. So they're like great characters. But, you know, there was tough subject matter. And I appreciate Shauna being here and Brian. It's like we had lots of conversations about the tone of the movie, how far we could push given the parameters and everything else to still keep you in the movie and have an audience that can be big. Um, and that was, we, we worked hard at that, I would say. We had so, we had, that was kind of some, the biggest conversation we had before shooting and during shooting was really hitting the tone correctly, right? Yeah, totally. And, I appreciate you saying that because it is, I think, the single hardest thing to try and do in a movie like this. And I've made a lot of sort of young, you know, material for younger viewers and sort of co-viewing. And it's it's so difficult, I think, to sort of thread that needle and figure out how you make a movie that like a 12-year-old, 13-year-old can watch, but you're not losing everybody else. Um, and... I'm still trying to figure it out. Like, there's there's no sort of easy answer to it, and I think that to me, I just think we don't give kids, young people, enough credit for a what they're what they're able to watch and digest and think about. I've been in focus groups for not for this movie, for other stuff where the kids just blow you away with with what they're getting from the material, and I think. As we get older, and I know now as a parent, we get more scared sometimes for our kids than they are for themselves. And and I think we sort of inherently, as we're making these stories, can have this reaction of trying to protect them, and it does a disservice to the material, and it you know ultimately does a disservice to them as viewers. Definitely have to ask, there is a kissing scene between kids in this movie. What is that like as a director when the kids are possibly kissing in, for, in real life for the first time. What is that conversation like? How awkward is it? Uh, you know, and I, I'm, I'm just curious. Yeah, it was definitely an interesting day. Um, so we had a intimacy coach that came um, and we rehearsed with the kids, not the kiss. We just rehearsed sort of the blocking the weekend before we were shooting it. And it was on their minds. I mean, from the moment they showed up, you know, in rehearsal, I do a lot of rehearsal, and this was just kind of this thing that was hanging over them. And there was one point where it was gonna be like in week one or week two, and I just said like, I just think that's a bad idea. Like let them legitimately become friends, hopefully over the course of the movie, and let's shoot it in like the last week, which ultimately we did. And we, so we had an intimacy coach. At this point, they were best, best friends. And what's interesting is you would watch them and they'd be all over each other as best friends. And then the minute we would rehearse, it was like they didn't know each other. <laughs> and their parents were with us in the room rehearsing, and their parents were like, guys, you had a sleepover last night and you're such close friends, like what's going on? But it's obviously a very different thing when, you, when you're having to perform. And so we worked through the blocking of that, and then we, you know, so they were comfortable with that. We didn't have to do that on the day. And then we went there on the day with three hours to shoot that scene. Um, because we had to do it at magic hour and, and play it for sunrise. Um, so the whole time we're just losing light, the whole, the whole time we're shooting that scene. And I think it's going pretty well. And they're, 
you know, they're very sweet together and we're shooting with two cameras. So anything that, you know, one is doing, we're capturing the other one. And Naomi comes up to me. And so she's, we're on this hill and in the middle of nowhere and like the whole crew is hiked up this hill and like I'm all the way down over there and Naomi is like all the way back over there, like, I don't know, 200 yards away. And she's with the parents and we're shooting and we're shooting and she sort of comes up and I go to her and I'm like, I think, I think it's going well. Like, I actually think we're, we're getting it right. Like, I think we're getting the scene. And she's like, well, yes, you know, I just want to tell you, like the parents are both crying. Like they're, they're having this whole thing, they're both crying. And I remember saying, well, I don't care that the parents are crying like that. Obviously they're crying and said, that doesn't mean it's good. Like the, the, their emotion doesn't count. I thought she was saying like, it's so good. Right. It's so good, people are crying. And Naomi was like, you're not hearing me. I'm dealing with a whole other thing going on there where these parents were seeing their children have their first kiss. Yep. And so Naomi was dealing with this whole other thing. That was kind of a moment where you go like, right, you need a great producer on set because like there's all this other stuff going on that you're totally unaware of. Nay, would you like to fill in the blanks? <laughs> well, I will just say that we had the most fantastic parents on this set, which is such a gift when you're making a film with kids, to have parents who are so supportive of the process and are just really great to hang out with. And Che and Brooklyn both have like wonderful, wonderful parents who I adore. Um, but they were basically having an out of body experience <laughs> watching their kids have their first kiss. And uh, yeah, so I think in that moment, I was just saying like, maybe we should just take a break, like every, let everybody collect themselves, because it was very emotional for them. And uh, I think they were very happy with what they were seeing, but obviously they were experiencing it on two levels, one as the parents of professional actors, and then also just as parents. Um, but yeah, the scene, it was a, it was a very big day. <laughs> it was a very big day for, for everyone, but it, it, it turned out really well. We're, we're really pleased with how it came out. Why this title? The, this was interesting because it was the title of the story. And I it came to me immediately um, because of the Jimi Hendrix song. Somehow music connected in my head um, right away. And... The idea of referring to the birds, but in a somewhat oblique way, plus the word little made, I was thinking about Sedona, which was the name of the real girl, and just her her youth. It's rare that I write the headline for my own piece, actually. Um, you know, a lot of times I, I just can't think of a good headline, and editors tend to be better at that. Than, than writers, but I came with that title and I was really adamant about it. I was delighted that we kept it for the film. Um, and certainly I've seen <laughs> many of my um, film projects end up with different titles, but I, I just think it's so evocative. And any of us who are familiar with the Jimi Hendrix song too it's you know it's sort of it's very resonant when you hear that title and i assumed there was no way i'm sure jimi hendrix music first of all wrong era but um i assume it costs a fortune to use jimi hendrix music in a in a movie but it still um felt so right when you saw the shooting schedule uh, what was the day you had circled in terms of I can't wait to film this? And what was the day you had circled in terms of how the F are we going to film this? And maybe the second part is the kids kissing. I, I'm just guessing. No, the well, the the thing that we stressed out the most about was the sequence outside the warehouse where uh, the brother gets hoisted up because that was day two. That was day two, three, and four of the shoot. And there was no way around scheduling that differently. And that's tough where you're all getting to know each other as the crew and you're thrown into night exterior, 
um, kids hours where, you know, Brooklyn is rapping, I, I don't know, it, I, you know, you only have nine hours or something to shoot. And so she's rapping early and then you're bringing in photo doubles. And, you know, at a certain point, Brian is rapping. So you're bringing in photo doubles and you have stunts. So uh, credit to Jeff Carter, the, the cinematographer who did an amazing job, who just came to me pretty early on in prep and was like, we have a problem. Like, we, we are not prepared for the sequence. And I was like, it's fine. Like, it's going to, you know, we had two nights. He was like, we don't have enough time. And I was like, no, it's okay. He's like, I've worked out the hours. Like, this is how many hours we have. And I was like, yeah, but it's like a close-up here, and it's like a close-up here, and it's like a close-up. And he's like, no, no, that's my whole world turning around. So we spent a lot of time prepping that, and it went so smoothly those three nights. And I just give all the credit to Jeff because it was just his preparation that got us through that. And, like, once we had sort of gotten over that hurdle, things sort of flowed pretty well. The, the scene I was most nervous about uh, was actually the last scene we, we shot with Brian, which is the scene in the office uh, where he confronts her and he, he tries to call her mom and there's a voicemail. Um, and it's sort of the first time where she really opens up about what's going on with her. And I was always nervous, <clears throat> nervous about that scene because I didn't, I couldn't, I just couldn't figure out the one of the beats that Brian plays as Jan. I just couldn't wrap my head around how he sort of hears this thing, confronts her, and then can sort of move on in the scene, but it's still lingering underneath the scene. And uh, he played it so well, and I actually didn't know that we got it on the day. I was still s sort of nervous about it, just because I was so, I think, in my own head about it. But once Martin cut the scene, it was like, oh, what, you know, Brian was doing all of these things that I don't know that I honestly was fully aware of that I think tracks the character totally through that scene. It's almost like Brian's talented. <laughs> almost, yeah. No, he's a gift. I think I, I just going to say, for me, the scene that I was the most excited to film was the uh, the scene of the bird release. It was uh, something that Dean very early on, like from the very start of the movie, had this idea from a lot of like research footage that had been done of what a bird release actually looks like, and that particular you know, truck that carries the birds, and we needed to get this truck, which was very difficult to do. It's an actual one, we had to, you know, we had to find somebody who was willing to play with us, and, and then we also needed some pigeon racers who were willing to release their birds, and, um, you know, pigeon racers are, you know, sometimes they respond to emails, sometimes they don't. <laughs> sometimes they take your phone calls, sometimes they don't. Sometimes they say they're gonna bring their birds and then they don't. And so it was sort of this day and also the weather in Portland is so unpredictable and it was like this day and we were like, oh my God, is the, is the truck gonna arrive? Are the birds gonna arrive? Is the weather gonna hold? And then we got there, and it was the most gorgeous day, and the all these wonderful characters, these bird racers came and brought their birds, and you know we only kind of had, you know, the one shot at it, and uh, and we got it, and it was just a gore. We had to all walk down like. Every, I felt like I was in a Fellini movie. Like everybody was sort of pushing a piece of equipment, and people had umbrellas, and we're walking like oh, you know, we had to walk really, really far and bring all our equipment down, and um, and then it just happened. And I mean, it's such an amazing scene in the in the movie. So yeah, and the one so I didn't even answer your question about what I was excited about. Maybe that gives you an insight into like I don't know making the movie, but I. I was excited about shooting the scene with the Russian Pigeon Mafia on the bridge. And partly because it was sort of day two of scouting, right at the beginning of pre-production, and that scene was scripted in a park. And we were scouting for other things, and I said, wow, wouldn't it be awesome to put that scene on that bridge, and the bridge can go up and down at the beginning of the scene? <laughs> Knowing full well in my head, I was never getting it. 
I thought he was joking when he said well, that. I was like, that's so funny. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I mean, I did say it seriously and was shocked in the moment when our line producer, Liz Brandenburg, who was amazing, was like, okay, we can look into that, knowing, okay, this is something I'm gonna give up later. I'm gonna say that this is the thing I really want. Maybe I'm giving away too much here for future problems. Like, this is the thing, and I'll, I'll trade it later for something. And I never had to trade it. And I said to the DP when we got there, I was like, I cannot believe we're on this bridge and they're stopping traffic and we're shooting the scene that was scripted in a park on this bridge. Uh, yeah. I think you should explain that this never happens. No, it doesn't. And it doesn't. And, and I think that that's testament <clears throat> to how passionate the crew was about the material. They loved the material. And they are, it's incredible shooting in Portland. Everyone does a million different jobs. They're all artists in, you know, the groups also have rock bands and also fine artists. And so you're just working with people who are artists and storytellers and want to bring the best thing to the screen. And I think the, the passion shows in the movie. I'm curious, uh, and this is, I like talking about editing. Uh, so who gave you the best feedback after seeing the movie or the best note after seeing the movie where you're like, F, I gotta fix this. It's three people. Yeah, I'm trying can not I, to curse, by the way. Can I can I say three people? Oh, 100%. So one is my wife, um, Alison Small, who's an amazing producer in her own right, and um, and and watched the mo a very very early cut of the movie and sort of unlocked unlocked sort of key things in the film um, about thematically where we were muddled, and it really kind of gave us a true north thematically very early on, which was really important. The other is my cousin, Jonathan Liebesman, a great director in his own right, and he came to an early screening, and um, he keyed on a similar thing in terms of thematically what was going on, but at that point we were sort of more advanced with it, but still hadn't quite fixed it, and also there were a lot of pacing things that Jonathan pointed out that once we started to implement those notes, it, the, the sort of movie told us what rhythm it was. Um, and then the last is Andre Nemec, a producer, who, one of the producers of Project Almanac, my first movie, who, who after the, uh, that same screening that Jonathan was at, really sort of after the screening, told me the things that really resonated for him and that can be as important as people telling you what isn't right because you sort of you're 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 knowing what what you're keeping and why you're keeping it and at that point in the process it's it's important to know like why you need to keep things for the two writers sitting up here I'm curious uh, it's a curveball question uh, besides this if someone has not read and actually, if someone's not read anything you've done before, uh, or a script, or what's the first thing you'd like them reading, and why? Ooh, wow, that is a curveball. Um, you know, I've I've actually been asked that before, and I'm always sort of stumped. Um, I I think I would probably say the Orchid Thief. Um, because it, it's, I, th I think, establishes a lot of how I approach stories, what attracts me, how, how I tell a story. Um, so, I mean, generally, that's, that's what I recommend. But I'm... I'm happy when people read anything. <laughs> so I, I'm also reluctant to be too prescriptive because I feel like if you want to read something of mine, whichever it is, go ahead. I would guess I would say flight because it's rare that a movie gets made that only has one writer. You know, a lot of times in our business, through all the iterations in different studios and producers that it goes through a lot of, other writers like touch it so flight was the same experience as this where i was the writer from start to finish and it took a million years for that movie to find its way to the screen too so you have a, uh, i was going to make a joke but uh, you have a track record of taking a, a long time for movies to get made yeah yeah <laughs> it's it's not a joke <laughs> uh how long did it take to cast the granger 
We we <laughs> we. He's here, actually. Right. He come down. There's, he he's played by three different birds, um, or maybe six different birds. They're in the credits. They have names. Um, they are. They were. Oh, oh, maybe because the lights came on. But we've credited all the birds, and they're in and and they're in the credits. Um, but. We tried our hardest, as Naomi said, to get real pigeon racers to give us their pigeons. And we thought, oh, of course they want their pigeons in a movie. And they didn't because it was racing season and they don't want their birds to mix with other birds because they might give each other diseases if they have diseases or whatever. So we bought 60 birds. And our amazing animal trainers, handlers, um, Roland and Lauren, raised 60 birds. And out of those 60 sort of started to audition who, you know, which of those birds could do the things that we needed them to do. And that's how we got to the Granger. And it was, and they actually don't really develop their iridescence until they're a certain age. So it was like a week and a half before shooting and we're looking at them and oh, we look- put makeup on one. We were going to, we were contemplating. <laughs> we did a makeup like, test actually we on like, one of them. We put, yeah, to it's get, all very safe. Yeah, it was all, it was approved. approved. But, but, you know, just because their iridescence wasn't quite coming in and we were, you know, I mean, that's the problem with eight weeks of prep when you have to raise a flock of pigeons. But yeah. um, ultimately, by, fast, the, by the time we really needed their like, cl- their true close ups. Uh, which were on a stage at the very end of the shoot. They were very beautiful and iridescent, so. Uh, I'm not sure if anyone is filming, but uh, this is a spoiler question, so let's not put this uh, on. In ca- you know what I mean, like this will be for later, but how did you guys figure out what, what the ending, or how did you figure out what the ending was gonna be? Was it always this ending? Did you debate on something else? I mean, I feel like it was always the ending. I'm trying to think of what is the ending. Um, life is sweet. Oh yeah, life is sweet. Yeah. yeah. No, that was always the ending. It's interesting because the scene in the truck, you know, there's a couple scenes because again, like I said, we had a lot of conversation about the tone of the movie and some of the language and how, you know, she ideates in moments in the movie, which is an intense thing. And so we had to kind of strike this right tone, and. You know, there was other like little bits and pieces of dialogue in the office scene that Dean referenced earlier and also in the truck, you know, where he says, you know, Vietnam taught me the meaning of life. And she kind of pushes him, but like we cut out of that scene and then he tells her later, not that he ever told her in the truck, but he kind of said to her, no, like it was more of a like, I'll never tell you that kind of thing. Uh, Because that was the moment I always ultimately wanted to land on was like him saying, hey, this probably is our last moment, but I wanted to just tell you. I know the meaning of life and I'm gonna share it with you now after everything we've been through. So yes, that was always the end. I do wanna um, just share an anecdote which really made me happy. Um, And that is when I did the original story, the pigeon racer who really sort of taught me everything about how racing works and you know, he was sort of my guide through this little subculture. Um, told me that he had terminal cancer and this and you know he didn't ever want to leave his house because of his birds and it was very emotional when the story was optioned and that all the people who I wrote about heard you know had their life rights option and so forth he was really eager, not in an obnoxious way, but in the way of someone who doesn't feel they have a lot of time, he would check in with me regularly. Is the film going to be made? Is the film going to be made? And it always really troubled me as the years ticked by because I thought, gosh, if this movie ever gets made, I don't know if Matt is going to be alive to see it. And lo and behold, his cancer went into remission and he he's alive to this day which was really almost unimaginable he had cancer in many parts of his body at the time that i was interviewing him um and i'm of course eager for him to see it and and also um i think the 
the way John incorporated that into the script was really authentic, and it feels really authentic to me. It it doesn't feel like a ploy to m get you to feel sympathetic with him. It, and in fact, this guy was delightful and very much very upbeat for considering the challenges that he was facing. But like Jan. His, he was driving his wife crazy because he never went on vacation. He never wanted to go on vacation because of his birds. I want to actually go back to the beginning of this Q&A. What was it like for you when you found out that Brooklyn, you cast her, you, you know, you're, on, you're about to start filming, and then you hear, uh, oh, by the way, she's afraid of birds. It's one of those things in prep where you literally are hearing a problem every 20 minutes. You know, just problem after problem after problem. So to me, I was just like, this is one of these problems that we're gonna have to figure out. And I trust that the professionals around us are gonna get her comfortable with the birds because she's just gonna have to be. And that she will, and that she'll pull through. So I didn't really stress too much about it. This was the, like a, a low stress situation. Yeah, you're just constantly bombarded with, yeah, sure. you know, yeah. So, yeah, they're all, they're all problems that have to be solved. Uh, this might be my last thing for the four of you. Um, and I rarely ask this, but I think this one, for this film I will, which is uh, for each of you, what do you really hope that like audiences, when they get to see the film, take away from it? I, I think uh, the thing that I hope audiences will take away from it, which is kind of what I take away from it, which is um, this idea that you, what you need in life may not be exactly what you think you want, um, and that you have to uh, be open and uh, be open and look up and embrace the unexpected that sometimes that is what is gonna lead you to where you need to go. I also think it's a really positive message about getting away from your cell phone and <laughs> going on an adventure, like in the real world. For me, the story was so much about the yearning for home. Pigeons have it, humans have it, obviously in the film that's the very center of what drives this, um, and it's Caitlin's yearning to keep her home, and her realization ultimately that home is not so specifically a building, but somewhere where you are loved. And and I I really feel like the movie captures that and really lands that idea in a way that really is really moving. Um, I think that you should take away that if somebody has something valuable and you want it, just go fucking take it. <laughs> and that's really my big take. Sometimes away. crime does pay. Yeah, crime pays. <laughs> that guy has some, I'm just gonna fuck. Uh, no, I think that, you know, um, moving through, like it was, it was funny because there's a scene in the movie where She's at her darkest moment, and the original line in the script was, the school therapist says that it's normal for teenagers to think about killing themselves, and I'm feeling really normal right now. Now that's heavy, right? I heard someone just go, oh, it's like, yeah. So we had to kind of modulate, you know, because I think that that's part of what's in this movie, is this girl who, at that age, hits this really dark moment. And when Jan says to her, well, that's a pretty, that's a permanent solution to a temporary problem. And he recognized it. He's somebody who's so many generations beyond her, but can recognize it and talk to her about it. So it's, you know, the idea that she fights through it, she meets this unlikely person who kind of helps her like pull out of this thing. So I think that, you know, if you find your way, like that's, that's I like going on a ride with a character. You want to talk about an arc, it's like she goes, <sighs> And I just kind of love that. I get very emotional watching it. I love the brother, too. Like, he's such, like, this great moment in the movie. You described that sequence that you guys put together because it wasn't scripted like that originally because you didn't have the, the buildings to do the jump that was originally scripted. So it's like you did the thing with throwing the bag and all this stuff. I'm like, my gosh, that's incredible. It's one of my favorite sequences in the movie. It's so emotional when he says, I'll get my stuff. Great. Life is sweet. That's what I take away. 
I think my takeaway, you know, every time I would give people the script, they would always talk to me about how interesting the theme was with the pigeons and home and that metaphor. And that was meaningful to me. Um, but it wasn't the thing that drew me to the movie and the metaphor I took from the birds. When the birds are released with the truck, they're released by a guy called the Liberator. That's his actual title when they go on the race. And to me, the birds always symbolized liberation in the film, that everyone in the movie in one way or another is in crisis. In one way or another, every single character is dying. And to me, what I take from the film and what I wanted to put into the film is this idea of pushing through to the other side of that crisis, not just solving it, but somehow soaring above it and sort of being liberated from it. So that's what I hope people take from it. I really want to say congrats to the four of you on such, I really think audiences are going to enjoy this film. For everyone who is out here uh, uh, and saw it tonight, uh, if you are on this thing called social media, uh, please, uh, and you enjoyed the movie, uh, please spread the word. And on that note, ladies and gentlemen, the filmmakers uh, behind Little Wing. Thank you, guys. Thanks for coming.